I had cancer, but I felt diseased. I felt like this, like it was so gross. This man didn't want to be with me. Like it pushed back my heart so hard. And I wasn't a hundred percent at that time that I was going to rebuild. Who would love me? I didn't know if I could love myself. Would I love me? Would I ever love my body again? I, I certainly didn't think a man would ever love me again. I, I thought that was over. This is another episode of our regular program, Cancer Friends. Thank you for joining us. And here is a friend, and that is Annette LaFontaine, who joins us from nearby in Lucadia, California, again, part of San Diego County. And the reason we know her is because now she's our massage therapist. Oh my God, we love Annette. <laughs> okay, so I'll just give a little background. Annette has had some real stresses in her life. She had a marriage to a man who you describe Annette as difficult with bipolar disease, um, some drug issues, and eventually you separated, yes. right? But then with three children, two of them became quite ill. Your yes. daughter as a teenager developed Hodgkin lymphoma. And yep. while she's fine now, that was a big stressor. Huge stressor. Huge. I can't, I can't even imagine a child with cancer. And your athletic son, one of your two, who became really debilitated and turned out to be Crohn's disease with a bleeding disorder. Bad yes. news, right? Difficult combo. So just to set this up, how stressful was your life? You eventually became a cancer patient, breast cancer. We're going to talk about that. But would you say that stress was really, really deep for you? Um, my, my integrative doctor says to me that cortisol is my worst enemy. And I bathed in cortisol for probably close to a decade. Um, just life brought me any hardships and challenges. And, you know, we all survived it. We all got through it, but I think it does, it takes a toll on you. And I think that, I, I think it's, I don't know if it's causational, but I think it's definitely part of my journey that allowed this to erupt in my life. And, you know, stress and we had talked about 2020, but that was a very stressful year. And then in 2021, I was diagnosed and I think my body just gave up the ghost. Like, you know, it was a lot. So well, let's hear about the diagnosis. Yeah, I want to hear about that just for, for folks who may not know when you refer to okay. cortisol, that is the process or the, the chemistry that happens when somebody is under extreme stress. And I yes. know from reading a lot now that there is some, there it looks like there is a medical physiological connection between high stress Absolutely. releasing cortisol and, and what happened. So what happened when you were dying? I, I found a lump. Um, I can't even say I was doing a self exam. I was just showering and I had a very lean body mass and it was very evident. Suddenly overnight, there was a lump and it was in my breast. And that's not a good place to find a lump. Uh, so I panicked a little bit and called a girlfriend. I was getting ready to go out to, on a dinner date. And I called my girlfriend and I said, should I stay home and freak out or should I go on this date? And she said, well, if you have cancer, you might as well go out and enjoy your life, go to dinner. <laughs> and it turned out I did have cancer. So what type um, of breast cancer did you find out you had? So I had uh, ductal cancer, breast cancer. Um, I was actually going to go back in my medical record and look for my actual diagnosis because it's so in the rear view mirror now. I, sometimes some of the details are fuzzy. I just remember I was estrogen, progesterone positive, HER2 negative, and that's the thing that you want to have come back. So you talk to the breast cancer doctors and uh, people are consumers now. And I guess the doctors are saying, what do you want to do? Yeah. 
And I, and I said, I don't want to have cancer. That's my choice. And they were like, okay, detail though. How do you want to get there? <laughs> and, you know, uh, so I was through scripts and they came to me um, as a team. They said, we're going to get you through this. We're very good at what we do. Um, and immediately, uh, and they assign you a navigator. A navigator, I'd never heard of it, but a navigator is somebody who helps you navigate this process because you are deer in the headlights. You don't know what's going on. It's a lot of details. It's a lot of coordinating and they help you get through this process. So they approached me that they were very good at what they did. That gave me confidence to hear them state that out loud. This person was my go-to person for all of my questions. And I had a lot of them. So I was very thankful for her and she was very responsive. Um, at, at, on the other side of it, I wasn't completely happy with all of my care. Um, there were some things that didn't go well, but throughout out, all of that process, I was able to communicate with my doctors and get through all of the issues that did arise. So I feel like I had good care. And in the end, I decided uh, during, in that window of time also during my diagnosis, I found out I was gonna be a grandmother. And I just was like, I'm, I'm gonna just go big. I'm just gonna do bilateral, just get, I'm, have had my kids, I'm at postmenopausal. I'm gonna just do a bilateral because I think that gives me the best chance of survival. So, and I understand you put everything in a flow chart for you to try to get to a decision. As, yes, because I was shocked they wanted me to be participating in the decision for my treatment. I thought that was kind of funny. Like, I don't, I don't know. How do you know? How, how, how am I gonna know? So Yes, I made a flow chart and I just started doing research, um, talking to people, talking to doctors, going online. And I ultimately did make a flow chart. And my flow chart started with just ignore it and do nothing and hope for the best. <laughs> that didn't have great outcomes. <laughs> um, all the way to a radical bilateral mastectomy. So I was maybe one step back from that. I had a skin sparing bilateral mastectomy. Okay. And, and ultimately, reconstruction, two reconstruction surgeries, right? Yes. And implants. Let's back up. Let's talk about the emotional side. So yes. you're, you had, there'd been a car accident. Yep. You, you had that and you're being wheeled in for surgery. What, what was going on in your head as far as your life and relationships? I think at that stage, I was just overwhelmed. I was not keeping it together. I was crying all the time. I'm probably gonna cry now. Um, but yes, I was with a man in, a, in, in what I thought was a great relationship. And on my diagnosis, he um, ended it because he had lost his first wife to triple negative. He watched her die a slow, horrific death. And he didn't wanna go through it again. I'd been in this car accident with him, went to an orthopedic doctor who said, my cancer treatment took precedent over fixing the injury I sustained and sent me off to do my cancer treatment, which was the first thing up was this bilateral mastectomy. So I was physically broken, mentally, spiritually, heart, like all the ways a human could be broken. And I, and COVID, go to the hospital alone to, to, have my, to, to subject my body to mutilation so that I could continue to try and live. It was dark and scary. And um, I tried to pray and meditate and none of my tools worked. And just for a period of time, I was just overwhelmed. I was not well. I didn't do, my heart rate was insanely high for probably two weeks. And it was just a hard time. I kind of don't know how I got through it. But how did you get through it? I think my, my kids were near. My kids were very comforting. And my kids had been through medical trauma themselves. So it was very interesting to hear them like parent me back to mirror my parenting back to me. They held me, told me it's okay. We'll get through it together. We got this. We do hard things together. And they 
they kept me together. And so it was kind of a circular experience to reflect back when I said things to them, right? And to have them kind of like bring that, that care to me was, was lovely. And I have a great network of girlfriends that are like my sisters. And they just started coming and they brought food and pillows and coffee and prayer beads and hugs. And sometimes I'd come home and there would just be like a little treat at, at my gates and just sweetness, just sweetness. And that you, I know as you were being wheeled in, you had this feeling, will anyone ever love me again? You know, because really. yes. yes. the man you'd been involved with couldn't handle it. I had cancer, but I felt diseased. I felt like this, like it was so gross. This man didn't want to be with me. Like it pushed back my heart so hard. It wasn't just that he broke up with me, which would have been sad. He broke up with me because I was, defective in some way something was wrong with me and I took that in like deeply and it hurt and then in that scenario to go in and have my breast removed the thing that one of the identifying features as a woman are being removed what and I'm gonna have scars and and I wasn't a hundred percent at that time that I was going to rebuild who would love me I didn't know if I could love myself would I love me would I ever love my body again? I, I certainly didn't think a man would ever love me again. I, I thought that was over. I could not have foreseen. So during that dark time, that initial time, I could not have even foreseen how I am now. I'm happy. I'm super comfortable in my body. I've actually come to love this body again. I have a man in my life that loves his body. He's never known my body any other way. He thinks it's great. <laughs> um, and, but so to get from that point to this point was a lot of work. It was a lot of work. It, it just creates a lot of existential thought about who you are. Who am I? What, what does it mean to be me or me, to be a woman or to be lovable? Like I had to do kind of a deep dive for a good- And that's life. included, I understand you see, a therapist who's helped you dig into the, all the trauma you went through to kind of sit with it to get past it. Yes, yes, we've done a lot of work. We, you know, much, much laughter about it, also many tears. Um, but I got through the initial medical stuff um, moving forward, but. At some stage, I kind of realized. What, what, so eventually, I circled back to have this orthopedic work done um, that I had to postpone. And in that work, um, I had a couple of uh, I had to be in a couple of surgical procedures, and I lost it. <laughs> I had a meltdown, and it wasn't because of what was happening. It was because it had triggered my surgical stuff from my cancer. And in that moment, I kind of like had this out of body experience, like, oh, I'm in a room full of doctors and I am falling apart right now. <laughs> in that moment, I was like, oh, I think maybe I need to get some help. I think that there's more trauma in here that I need to work through. Well, mm -hmm. good for you. Now, you alluded to meeting someone. Yeah, uh, unintentionally. I was at a, a gathering of women. We, we tend to gather on full moons because we live in North County, San Diego, and we do stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, a lot of, a lot of woo. Um, and everybody was sort of passing around their phones. They're all in a dating app called Bumble. And I thought, I was pretty fresh off my third and final surgery. And I thought maybe later in the year, I maybe would start thinking about dating, but I downloaded the app. One of the women in the room grabbed my phone, uploaded my, like just did my profile. Um, so I started swiping and just out of curiosity. And there was a gentleman who just caught my eye. He was very dapper. And, um, we messaged a little bit and that evolved into a first date. And on that first date, we were really hitting it off. We just had a lovely conversation. I love his energy and demeanor. And then I got in my head, like, 
should I tell him I have cancer? Like, this is a fresh, this is, was a big thing in my life. And here I am on a date, having not thought this through. And so I just blurted it out to him in our conversation. I said, you know, so here's this journey I was on recently. And he listened, he made eye contact. He was kind, he asked a couple questions. He was so sweet. And at the end of my story, he kind of paused and he said, you know, he said about four years ago, I had cancer too. And he had prostate cancer. And his whole journey was, am I gonna be lovable? Am I gonna be functional? Who am I am as, as a man if that's impactful to, to him? And it turned out that he came through whole, I came through whole. And it was kind of a bonding experience for us because we were both like, oh my God, me too. And we comfortably talked about it. I could not have foreseen that date. And um, it's been kind of magic. Oh, what a wonderful surprise, right? After yes. all the ups and downs, what a wonderful surprise to find somebody who got it, understood it, saw you as a wonderful person you are, you know? And you know what, to now we're maybe like, uh, so that was in March, we're November now. And I think he's been, he's been so supportive to me. I think he's helped me feel whole in my body too. He just loves me. He doesn't see the scars. It, that doesn't matter to him. And that makes me feel more myself and lovable again. So. so Annette, for all the people watching and listening, Yes. Mostly cancer patients, some family members as well. Some of them have gone through the depths of down feelings and struggle that you've talked about, and they want to get to a better place. What advice do you have? Because you've gone on this roller coaster and it, we're delighted that you have this relationship now. You've done this work. You feel good in yourself. We're delighted to have you as our massage therapist and get to know you better. What do you want to leave people with? Maybe some suggestions of how they can get there too. There are a lot of resources available to people. Um, when you're going through treatment, there are groups that you can join. Um, there are uh, social workers, therapists, um, your network of friends, family, your spiritual life. Um, I, I couldn't do the group meetings. I tried a couple of different things, but I couldn't look at a room full of people who are so impacted and had so much heavy content. I, I, I couldn't do that, but I could see that a lot of people garnered a lot of benefit from that. One of the things that started to pull me out of the deep darkness was another cancer survivor reached out to me. And she became my cancer mentor. And like when I would, a drain popped out and I was bleeding all over the place, like freaking, I called her, she would do this thing. All right, we're gonna take a couple of deep breaths. And she just knew, she knew the language I spoke and she could calm me down and she'd been through all of it. She'd been through all of it. So she knew, and she knew my emotional content and she helped me step through kind of day by day. Um, and I felt like that was really valuable because so many people love and support you. You're gonna be okay, we're here for you. Um, all of those positive things, but it's really helpful to get in the nitty gritty with somebody who's been there, who's, who's been where you are. Because when they tell you, I, I hear you, that's, that's hard. But we are gonna get through this one day. We're gonna get through this day and then the next day. And you know, you're kind of in this 12 step program. Um, so it's good to have somebody who shares a common experience with you. Am I, am I? And as you uh, had told us, you wondered at, at the very lowest point, would anybody ever love you again? And now yeah. someone does. How, yes. what advice would you give to single women in particular, or even single men, where they can have hope that they could find a successful relationship? Right. Um, ha having the experiences that I've had, it, it became clarifying to relationships. So that man that broke up with me 
God bless him. Thank you. That was a, ultimately a good thing. And moving forward, I had to filter relationships through different lenses. Like what is important to me? Like all of this stuff is just a bag of bones. Like what's important? And it helped me refocus what I wanted in a relationship. And it had a lot to do, it had a lot less to do with the physical stuff. And it had more to do with somebody's heart and their character and their spirit. And the spiritual process is very important to me. And the man that I met, I'm, I'm more of a Buddhist. He has a, a different spiritual journey, but he has a spiritual journey. And we were able to and continue to connect about that. So yes, you're going to be different. Your body is going to change. Um, it is going to be different. But you are, you are lovable. You always have been, always will be. And we, I am love. We are all love. And you just have to find people you can connect with that. And I was afraid I was going to be unlovable. And the universe just unloaded love on me from my family, from my friends, and eventually from this man. So I was afraid I would not be lovable. But that was not, that was just my pain talking. That was not reality. And it just takes well to, to move through that and to find that love and to feel at peace again. And it takes, it just takes the time it takes. You know, you, we all just have to process it in the time and in the way that gets us to that end goal. But we wish you only good times and love. Uh, we'll all have challenges going forward. I mean, you take a medicine to limit your risk of a recurrence. Yes. Um, yes. As many women who've been treated for breast cancer have. Can you so, speak about that for a minute? Yeah, certainly. Sure. Yeah, because you always worry, is there another shoe that'll drop? Absolutely. And the friend that was my cancer mentor, she stopped talking to me for a while at some stage. And her cancer had come back and metastasized. And she is now fighting for her life. Um, and she just did not want to share that with me at that stage of my journey, right? Um, but I did not want to take the aromatase inhibitor for three to five years or however long it was. I drug my feet and drug my feet um, because it has side effects. And you know, eventually when I did start taking it, I had side effects and then I stopped it. Um, but um, I, I take that pill every day now and I'm happy about it. I take that pill and it reaffirms my will to live every day. It reaffirms that I'm a survivor and I got from that place to this place in every day when I take that pill, I don't think about the negative parts of it and the side effects. I think that, 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 that's me being a fighter still. I want to live. So they're not, some of that medication does definitely have side effects and complications, but well worth it. So well said. I take a, a daily cancer medicine too, and I do feel it's my, my will to live. Your so, life affirming. Life affirming. Very ritual. Good. So thank you so much yeah. for sharing your story, your journey. It's um, great that you're in a better place. We look forward to seeing you in person soon. And giving you a big hug. And giving you Yay. a big hug. And Back I'm at sure you there, too. I'm sure among our viewers, there are people who wish they could hug you physically Aww. right now. But I think you've given them a hug of confidence that uh, things can improve even when you feel you're at your lowest point. Yes. Annette LaFontaine, thank you so much thank for being with so us much, today. Annette. Thank you both so much. You are a blessing in my life. Thank you.